to all of you for coming along and uh, attending here. Um, also, of course, a special thanks to Harry and Plinio, who are here as the expert discussants for this. And um, there are actually some extra thanks to give before we get going. So thanks very, very much to um, Dr. Susie Gage for offering to speak on this. But unfortunately, um, she's somewhat under the weather today, so I have to pull out. So very, very um, uh, sorry to be missing Susie, and I will try to find another uh, one of these which I can break her into speaking to again. I'm also very sorry to all of you in the crowd who were hoping to listen to Susie today, but hopefully we can ably um, cover the points she would have done. Also, many, many thanks to Steve Rolls, who had initially asked to be part of this. Unfortunately, we couldn't find dates for all speakers to work, but we could find today when three of the speakers could speak. Um, so again, uh, thank you very much for your enthusiasm for partaking this event, Steve. Um, and sorry we couldn't uh, have you here in the end, but also many thanks since kind of we sent a very nice follow-up email of this is the sort of stuff I would have talked about. Here's a thread of my thoughts I put together. Here's some of the important things you need to be, uh, you, you need to be looking at. Um, so again, uh, thanks uh, to Steve and sorry you couldn't be here. A final thanks as well. In the initial uh, stages of this, I was actually speaking to Josh Torrance. Um, who's doctoral candidate at Bristol University, and he gave me some interesting insights as well, um, which will certainly drive some of the discussion. So thank you to all of those. I wonder if Josh might actually be in the crowd. Is he here to have been embarrassed by me? I'm not sure. Anyway, thank you very much all for joining. We have 200 on the dot. Um, so I think let's maybe start this proper then. Um, as I said, this is set to be our most well attended event. So extra thanks to the guests, to the expert guests for, for creating so much interest to this. Thanks again, all of you for turning up. So we'll work through um, discussing some of the key issues for understanding use, risks, benefits, policy, harms of the use of nitrous oxides. Um, I'll now introduce uh, Dr. Plinio Ferreira. So please, Plinio, could you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself, a little bit about your research, and if you could give us perhaps some background on nitrous oxide, how it works, what it's been used for. Um, so yeah, um, welcome and thank you, Plinio. Um, so yeah, if you could yeah, tell us about yourself and, and what you do. Right, thanks, James. Uh... Thanks again, uh, Drug Science, for putting this panel together. Um, I'm speaking straight from uh, my workplace. So I work at Imperial College London and just beside the museums for people who have been to London. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher here and I work in the National Heart and Lung Institute. So my group is basically focused on vascular science and the interplay between the kidneys, the lungs, the vessels in the whole body and how this uh, relates to vascular disease. And we're trying to understand mechanisms to minimize uh, vascular disease. So, um, so why I'm here, basically, I'm, 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 I started my career as uh, doing the, uh, the course of pharmacy and biochemistry at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, and then I carried on, did a PhD on pharmacology in, uh, in, in the University of Sao Paulo with a period, uh, with half, half of it I did here at Queen Mary University as well. And then I went to do a postdoc at the University of Reading. And now I'm a postdoc here in Imperial College. Uh, parallel to that, I'm also a uh, voluntary uh, research, uh, researcher at drug science. Um, and I do a project uh, di in directly with uh, Prof Nut, where we we investigate uh, a bit about nitrous oxide and and poppers, which are two drugs um, very common in the streets nowadays, and also uh, 
basically two gases that are inhaled. So Prof needed someone to help him on, on these questions with these gases, and these gases are directly related to nitric oxide. Nitric oxide being the most or a very important vasodilator. That means that it's a gas responsible to dilate vessels and relax uh, muscles at the end of, of the signaling cascade. So it's a super important gas. It's being related to many diseases. So it's in, in general terms, it's good for your vessels to be elastic. So when the vessels to be elastic, to be able to dilate properly, you need uh, input of um, nitric oxide. So my PhD was in nitric oxide in related to platelets and how this is also related to vascular disease. So me being super interested in everything that drug science does and, and prof not does, all the way since my my university years, I yeah I've sent many messages through through the years trying to to do something at drug science and then suddenly this project came and, and I'm very lucky that they selected me to 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 help them with with this and now it's been over two years we have two papers published in this uh, particular area, which I've, uh, uh, which I've led writing it, but also with the help of many collaborators, which we'll be speaking a bit about it in uh, later. So to start with, uh, so today we're, we're gonna be speaking, speaking uh, specifically about nitrous oxide from, from the balloons. Um, so I have some slides on, on the history and a bit of the pharmacology of it. So I'm gonna share. I think everyone can see now, right? I just need to make it bigger. One second. Okay, yes. So this is a talk I've given at um, a conference called Science uh, about two months ago. Some of these slides are taken from that talk where I spoke about balloons and, and poppers. So specifically here, I'll be speaking more about balloons and, and how and that's the presentation of how we see the drug being taken in the streets. It's usually people inhaling from balloons. These balloons are filled up with compressed gas, which is either in uh, small canisters, the whippets uh, that we see uh, around. And now we've got um, this big canister uh, has a label called Smart Whip. You can see everywhere. And, and the, the, the most common presentation are now these big, big canisters uh, are, that we see around. The molecule of nitrous oxide, that's how it looks like. I'm not gonna go too much into detail of the chemistry of it. But uh, this is a very important uh, slide for us to start understanding where do we situate into nitrous, nitrous oxide consumption uh, overall. So this is a slide taken from the Global Drug Survey, which is a, a online survey that people from all over the world can go and fill in about their, their drug habits, what do they, they do in terms of uh, illicit drug intake. And it's, it's done every year. And it's been uh, around 50,000 responses per year. It's growing and growing. Uh, so we can have a good idea of what is the, uh, the drug habit consumption all over the world. Obviously, this is all always a bit skewed up to the top because people that will tend to to respond 
uh, they tend to consume something, so they're interested and they want to contribute. But we can have an idea of the, we can have an exact idea of the responders, how many people have been taken nitric oxide in, uh, uh, in the past and in the last year. So about, so 22.5% of people that responded the global drug survey in 2020, 2021, um, manifested that they took uh, nitric oxide, nitrous oxide of the balloons at least once in their life. And about 9.7% had used this in the last year. So about 10% of people uh, have been used that in the last year. So that's more or less about the statistics we have with uh, 16 to 25 year olds here in the UK. The average uh, estimate is that about 10% of 16 to 25 year olds have took nitrous oxide at least once uh, in the UK, which counts about half a million uh, youths uh, or youngsters. So about about history of nitrous oxide it's a gas it's a very old uh gas that's been around society since 1793 the person who discovered it is called joseph Priestley, which is a very important chemistry he has also discovered oxygen and in 1798 humphrey davy which is also a super important science scientist for the pharmacology world. He tested on, on himself and he observed two things. First, it was in a euphoric effect. And also he had a bit of toothache. So he kind of relieved, relieved the pain of his toothache. So because of this euphoric effect, he coined the term laughing gas. And this is 1798, okay? So that's over 200 years ago. So for the next 40 years, the primary use for nitrous oxide was only recreational enjoyment and public shows. There was no application in medicine whatsoever in the first 40 years that nitrous oxide was discovered. So people would uh, have these laughing gas parties that would be laughing gas available and people would enjoy themselves uh, and also public shows around uh, traveling, uh, demonstrating this uh, funny gas that people would take, have a half, uh, half a minute, one minute, two minute rush, and then get back to extremely uh, total normal uh, uh, faculties. So in 1844, a dentist called Horace Wells, he had one, uh, one of his teeth uh, extracted while inhaling nitrous oxide, and he said that was painless. So the next year, he went to a hospital, I think it was in uh, Boston, uh, to do a demonstration of this technique but ended up as a failure and the, because the patients start crying in the middle of the operation. So it's not a super strong uh, um, anesthetic. It's so, it's, it's, since the beginning, it, it showed that it's a kind of a mild effect, especially uh, for a tooth extraction, which is something that it's, it hurts a lot. So nowadays when, uh, nitrous oxide is used as an anesthetic, it's used as an inducer of, um, of an anesthesia and then combined with some other uh, anesthetics that the anesthetist might find useful for it. Okay, so this is a cartoon depicting uh, about one of these uh, parties in, uh, in the 19th century. So you can see Humphrey Davy with a big balloon uh, administering to uh, a lady, and we can see another lady in the corner already uh, enjoying the, the effect of it. And this is taken from the Welcome Collection. And also another cartoon from these parties. Uh, this one is probably inside his, uh, his uh, lab, or because you can see the glassware on the side and also these cartoons of uh, anatomical uh, 
uh, drawings in the back. So, as I said in the beginning, this was a, the, this gas was a completely uh, recreational uh, use only. However, uh, towards the early 20th, uh, 20th century, this uh, gas start, started to be used in anesthesia. So this cartoon taken from uh, the Science Museum. And here in the 1930s, uh, a patient administering uh, herself nitrous oxide while before just uh, to, to have some sort of uh, dental procedure. So this was more or less how the device looked like. But then, you know, uh, in the beginning of, uh, of the 21st century, we've started seeing this very common and that's the type of, uh, uh, of presentation we see now more commonly, although nitrous oxide is still used into anesthesia, especially for labor delivery and also for dental procedures, also used in kids, for kids for dental procedures. So overall consider it a, a harmless uh, gas because you, you can even use that in kids and, and also on women giving birth in, obviously uh, occasional situations. And that's a, a photo I quite like. So that's from August, 2015. There was a protest, people inhaling balloons outside parliament uh, to protest against the possible prohibition that could uh, lead into the psychoactive substance bill. Uh, which was being discussed at the time. Uh, I'm sure we'll discuss more, but at the moment, uh, the use of nitrous oxide is not illegal. So it's legal to use, it's illegal to sell, but we're gonna talk a bit more about it later. Uh, another thing which I find important to tell is how nitrous oxide is produced. Its main route of production is from uh, ammonium nitrate, which is then heated and, and then uh, breaks up into water and nitrous oxide. Obviously this is done in extremely controlled situations because ammonium nitrate is an extremely dangerous uh, substance, very, very flammable. So uh, this is a, a kind of an industrial uh, chemist, chemi um, chemical route to production of nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is a strong greenhouse gas. So um, it has a 265 fold greater uh, global warming potential than, than carbon dioxide. What does that mean? That means that one molecule of nitrous oxide compared to one molecule of carbon dioxide nitrous oxide has a 265 fold uh, greater potential to global warming. So it's, it's uh, less um, degradable than carbon dioxide, therefore it tends to stick more into the ozone layer. So it's, a, it's quite nasty gas for, for the ozone layer, but it has a very low uh, abundance compared to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is the main uh, being a global warming uh, gas. And ammonium nitrate was the gas, was the substance responsible for the explosion in Beirut in August to 2020 that we might remember the biggest uh, city explosion since the, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. Uh, so wiped out a lot of the city, many people died. So just for us to situate where these uh, substance come from and what they could cause if not taken care uh, properly. Um, so a quick introduction on the pharmacology of nitrous oxide. So it's a, it's a gas that the intensity of the dose will lead to a physiological response, which will have uh, individual mechanism of action. 
So if you use in a high dose, we will have a different mechanism of action than a, than a small dose. So to make it a bit more uh, easy to understand, the dose that is being used into the recreational settings are low to sub, sub anesthetic doses because these are uh, doses that you can do without uh, the anesthetic environment. Okay, so low to sub anesthetic doses lead to analgesia and anxiolysis. Uh, analgesia is uh, thought to work around the opioid receptor and anxiolysis is thought to be worked on the benzodiazepine and the GABA uh, axis, okay? Whereas the highest dose that leads to anesthesia works on the NMDA antagonism. These are all receptors that drugs, uh, uh, that illegal drugs work, but um, nitrous oxide being uh, a gas and has, might have, some sort of different mechanism in these receptors. I just want to make clear, uh, make clear here that none of these is uh, completely elucidated. These are all theories how nitrous oxide work. The mechanism of action is still uh, not fully uh, understood. And also it's important to point out that regular heavy use could lead to B12 deficiency and which is essential for maintaining the nervous system and could lead to myeloneuropathy uh, symptoms, which numbness of the limbs and weakness and ultimately leading to paresthesia, which is also something we're gonna speak about later about the heavy uh, use of nitrous oxide. Okay, um, I think I'll stop here for now because we're gonna start, start talking about uh, legal status and uh, the soci sociological aspect of it later. Okay, thank you very, very much for that, Pinio. Um, so I'm very, very uh, grateful you could kind of uh, offer that part of it last minute. We kind of had uh, Susie penciled in to talk about the how it works. Actually, I didn't realise we would have a historical section. So that was excellent, very, very useful, interesting, and a lot of stuff I, I didn't know about at all. So thank you very much. Um, so now, uh, Harry. Um, we could introduce you, so perhaps tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and maybe tell us a little bit about um, your interest in nitrous and any kind of work in this area regarding nitrous that you've been doing. Yeah, thanks James. So my name's Harry Sumnall. I'm a Professor of Substance Use at the Public Health Institute at Liverpool John Moores University. So I've been researching drugs from molecular level to drug policy for around 20 years. Uh, at the moment, my research is quite varied, ranging from trying to understand why there's been an apparent increase in, in drug use in the UK and young people to the development and evaluation of interventions. Uh, but over the years, I've also been very active in, in, in drugs policy, uh, both at the European level, uh, a consultant for the, for the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, and I was a member of the ACMD between 2011 and 2019. So that's the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs. So I have a broad interest uh, in, in, in a whole range of, of drug topics. Now, with regards to nitrous oxide, I, I've not done any specific research on this uh, outside of you know, investigating this as part of other issues, trying to understand patterns of drug use. But I think nitrous oxide is particularly interesting because, because it's, it's turned in, particularly in the UK, it's a substance which is taken on more meaning. It has a greater impact than simply its toxicology and pharmacology and psychopharmacology. And uh, obviously, Plinio has given a really nice introduction in the background to, to this substance. But uh, whilst I was preparing for this uh, webinar, I remembered that in 2015, I think it was, the YouGov polling organisation uh, uh, asked the UK public, representative sample of the UK public, to rate the various harms and dangerousness of different drugs and, 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 and uh, uh, to rate those relative to each other. If I remember correctly, about 22% rated laughing gas, i.e. Nitrous oxide has been a harmful substance, and that was less than the, the proportion who thought it was. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, sorry, uh, more people thought cannabis and, and alcohol was more harmful. But then the participants were also asked to describe and rate the harms of hippie crack, 
which if you're in the UK, you'll know is a popular media term for uh, nitrous oxide. I think it probably emerged from the United States in the early 1980s where nitrous oxide was popular in the, the Grateful Dead music scene. And there, around about a third, 33% thought that hippie crack was more harmful than nitrous oxide. And now obviously they're the same drug. So I think that probably reflects two things. One, that in general, despite that this being a popular drug, so as uh, uh, Plinio mentioned, around 10% of 16 to 24 year olds in the, in the UK will have used this, that's about 800,000 people. I think probably more people have actually heard about it or seen it or seen the litter and debris of use than has probably actually used it. So just reflecting on my background, nitrous oxide was a, was a substance which uh, uh, we were encouraged to administer to each other in our neuropsychopharmacology practical classes back when I was at university. But you know, a sizable proportion of people have, have used this, this drug. And, it's relatively safe, you know, no drug is not without risk. So in terms of deaths in England and Wales, which of course is the ultimate most extreme harm, there's around about five a year. And I would say that that's probably proportionate to the amount of people who are using it. And obviously any drug, any amount of drug death is, is one too many, uh, but it's probably proportionate. And interestingly, because there's perhaps some, perhaps some signs that it might actually be decreasing in popularity. So in the UK, we had the recent school survey. And although it was affected by COVID, levels of use decreased from about 4% use in the last year, uh, back in 2016, to about 1.5% in the most recent survey. So like other drugs, it comes in peaks and troughs in terms of popularity. Uh, there's been quite a bit of media attention on some of the other types of harms as well. So many of you who've, who've seen the news or BBC TV and ITV have done programs about this. Uh, the concerns of clinicians in particular, and this is also echoing concerns of clinicians in the Netherlands and France and, and, and Australia as well, that cl clinicians are reporting, at least anecdotally, an increase in the number of young patients, young presentations with quite serious neurological responses. Uh, adverse outcomes, the sorts of things that Plinio was talking about. Now, it's, it, it's difficult to get a sense of the extent of that because we're not very good at collecting uh, data on nitrous oxide in, in many countries. It, it's not regularly asked for historically, so there wouldn't be the clinical investigations. I think because of the quasi illegal or controlled status of the drug that when, particularly when young people are presenting to uh, to hospitals, they're less likely to declare their use. Clinicians are, are, are not asking those sorts of questions. So I, I do suspect that after a summer of increased attention on this, we might get a better picture of the true extent of, of some of the serious harms. But it's also important to state that those serious harms are quite rare. Uh, even though some clinicians have described this as, a, a, as an epidemic, you know, a, a deluge or tsunami of presentations. I think if you're working on the cold face, so to speak, in the health service, even a small increase in presentations is going to be of concern. So I, I have a public health background, so I'm interested in population and societal level harms. My reading of the data is that those sorts of presentations are proportionate to the levels of use. So there's not a disproportionately high level of use. And I think perhaps uh, maybe of, of, uh, of maybe more immediate concern are, is around potentially some of the harms associated with, with acute use. So we know that through modes of administration, people can suffer burns to the lips. Uh, some of the deaths are through asphyxiation uh, and mechanisms of administration. But, you know, common things like burns to, to the mouth and lips. Uh, many people are reporting that. But but, you know, in general, in general, it's a it's a relatively safe drug. Uh, I, I I do have concerns though, and so I'm sure looking at the chat, at the introductions, uh, looking at some of the people, uh, some of the people reporting from drug services as well, particularly about the emergence of the large canisters. So Plinio was talking about the smaller eight gram canisters, which contain about ten milliliters of, of gas under pressure. 
Now, for some of those hospital presentations that I mentioned, those patients are typically in their mid to late 20s, but they're reporting sometimes hundreds of canisters a day. So we're talking about a really high level of use. And that's of the small metal canisters. And obviously with the bigger canisters, which can contain maybe 40 times as much gas, some of the larger canisters, which are available in the Netherlands, for example, but we've not seen those in the United Kingdom, up to about two kilograms, so equivalent to uh, some of the anesthetic supplies. So literally hundreds of times uh, the volume of gas that potentially could be in those small whippets. And that's what concerns me because this is a new development in the market and many retailers are actively uh, promoting these sorts of products. So these are harm promoting products, I think. Uh, they're being promoted in relation to them being cost effective uh, where they're being openly sold and promoted online because of the legal situation, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a moment, they can't be accompanied by harm reduction advice. So it's all a bit of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Here's, here's some high levels of gas, cost effectiveness for your whipped cream parties, whatever a whipped cream party is. I don't really want to think about that in too much detail. So, so I, I, I think, I, I, I think, here we have a really messy situation that some of those some of those harms are yes associated with, with nitrous oxide itself but i think and of course we'll talk about some of the legal responses and some of the policy responses but i do think there's a real recklessness on behalf of of many retailers around these newer products uh, and uh, I think that needs uh, a lot of attention. And, and before I finish and hand back to, to James, of, of course, you know, uh, uh, I, I study the harms of drugs, you know, the public health harms. It's, it's important to recognise the positive aspects and benefits. And although nitrous oxide has a reputation of being, you know, relatively mild drug, 15 to 30 seconds up to a minute of euphoria, something that people can enjoy between other drug taking activities. There was a very interesting paper for those of you who, who want to look at this in a bit more detail by Sarah McLean, who's a, an Australian academic, and she did an analysis of the Reddit user, user forums around harm reduction practices, but also the pleasures and mechanisms of use. And, and, and on Reddit, for example, talking about quite profound effects of nitrous oxide, particularly when used in combination with other drugs such as MDMA or uh, psychedelics, which kind of mirrors going back full circle, mirrors uh, use in the, the 70s and 80s on the, the whole Grateful Dead psychedelic rock scene in the USA. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll perhaps I'll post a link to that paper in, in the chat. But uh, that, that's it from me for the time being. Back to you, James. Hey, thank you very much for that. So there's actually one follow-up I'm going to ask you, but I'll go through a couple of other things first. So one is that the chat is absolutely going off, so thank you everyone for that. Um, some couple of interesting things, as uh, Harry had mentioned, which I did, again, I didn't know about this, um, that the hippie crack terminology first arose um, from the Grateful Dead era early, so I didn't know that, and then we had on Carenza Moore in the chat saying, yes, yeah, she heard it at free parties in London in the 1990s, I was hearing it on a similar scene in the early noughties, I think. I think the funny thing with that is that you know, it was a, a, a self-depreciating term that was used um, you know, by me and my friends in our youth. Then it all went quiet and then it re-arose in the Daily Mail. And we had a, a very sensible comment as well from someone saying this is kind of demonising language which doesn't help. And I'll agree it's quite funny. Something that's used tongue-in-cheek by users is then used for... Uh, angry headlines from the mail and then we have to say oh, actually maybe it was it was funny to use that term before it was being mass circulated in fear stories um the one thing there may have been some oh yeah another interesting thing um there are a few animation put in the in their festival survey i think i'll have to scroll i think it was 10 percent of festival goers using it and i think there's something interesting that has happened there as well since people going to festivals around the year 2006 will remember when it before the mid, when it would, could be sold from head shops on site at festivals and I remember Glade 2007 the really horribly muddy one queues and queues and possibly since it was too wet for everyone to use conventional drugs people were just uh, queuing and queuing and queuing for these balloons which they were being sold from you know legitimate outlets then that was banned, but then a huge festival trade of people going around selling them. And I think now security have 
got on top of it, since it's quite a loud <laughs> and visible drug to be selling, um, the ch um, which you used to hear all the time at festivals, but don't really anymore. And I'm interested, someone else said, yeah, at Wireless Festival this year, there was not a balloon in sight. So um, I think that's particularly interesting. Um, yeah. And so I will actually now, I'm going to pass back to Harry. And so we have one question saying, can you hear a bit more about how it works in the brain and body and specifically how something um, that restricts the supply of oxygen to the brain can be healthy to use? So I wonder if I can pass that back to, if Harry's got any, Harry or Pliny, have got anything to say on that? I think Plinio is probably best place to respond to yeah, that. So one. shall we move over to Plinio? So Plinio, if you could maybe lead, say, if you say is you know something about the the dangers simply per se or lack of dangers if that's the case of inhaling nitrous oxide, um, and then perhaps once you've done that, if you could maybe go on and talk about the paper you authored recently, which tried to rank the harms. Um, I've actually just seen someone trying to deliver me a microwave. So I'm gonna run down and meet this delivery person and get my microwave. I'll be back with you all in about 30 seconds. So yeah, Plinio, if you could say more about, you know, effects on the brain of inhaling nitrous. All right, thanks, uh, James. So um, as I told uh, before, the mechanisms by which nitrous oxide uh, have this effect. When I, and when I say mechanism, I mean, when the molecule of nitrous oxide encounters a receptor in the brain, uh, what does that do uh, in terms of the proteins that will generate or in terms of uh, synapses that, that, that will create? So this is all not fully understood and I would say very marginal understood. So the mechanisms are still some sort of a mystery because people are not interested in into looking at that too much because what we have is uh, historical data. So these uh, gases have been used for over 200 years and even now, with this uh, extreme uh, consumption due to the big canister, there's not been, um, I haven't heard of an acute death during it. There is, There has been some uh, reports of, I would say less than 50 or, or ever that people had some sort of, um, cardiac problem whilst during it, but the, the scenario with those people who were involved, whether they were taking other drugs, whether they were cardiopaths, this is all not understood. So when you raise a flag about substance, when you see someone dropping dead after using it straight away, so, and we don't see that with nitrous oxide, you know, if it's, as Harry mentioned, if that is used under uh, occasional situations and it's very harmless. And that's the historical data we've been having for over 200 years. That's why this drug is also used during labor. So if you give to a pregnant woman who, who's delivering a baby at the time and you use this substance, to calm her down, it can't be that, that harmful, right? You, you, you would say uh, when, a, when a human being is on it in its most extreme and vulnerable situation as giving birth, you wouldn't uh, want to inflict harm on in this person. And also um, in situations where you have uh, to do a, a dental procedure in a kid, you would you would use this substance. So it's a very harmless uh, drug when used in into occasional settings. Um, the other question on uh, whether the gas that limits the oxygen to the brain, if that, what, how does it work? Well. Um, I'm not an aesthetist, so what I can say is that the limiting um, 
oxygen. The, I know that the brain has uh, a fairly, uh, um, how do you say, uh, an interval where it can have more or less oxygen. So we know that, for example, if we drown on a pool and stay 30 seconds, we're limiting uh, oxygen to the brain, right? And that doesn't make us uh, as a harmful situation. So the fact that you're limiting oxygen to your brain for a, a small period of time, that's not a uh, condition to brain damage because in many situations we uh, limit oxygen to our brain and the brain and other organs can uh, can uh, can hold well for, for for a period of time, the brain being the most uh, sensitive to it. Yeah, and also someone just said uh, that the nitrous oxide oxygen in mixture, this is the mixture used in uh, in, in the anesthetics, right? Um, also, when you inhale from the balloon, let's say you inhale the most you can. You, once you take the balloon out, the first inhale you give, it's from air again. So then you replenish the, the air oxygen uh, stocks to, to your lungs and will ultimately be uh, disposed to your brain. So that's, more or less where I can uh, tell about it. Um, also, um, as I told on the mechanism of uh, the different types of, of um, effects we have. So getting back to that slide, let me just open it for my guide again. So we know that it causes analgesia, anxiolysis, and ultimately anesthesia. Each one of them, of these uh, effects, have a particular mechanism involved. And also, this is all theories that you you test in mice, uh, and also into observation. In, for example, if a person who who takes uh, an opioid uh, antagonists, so something that blocks the opioid use tend to have less uh, effects of nitrous oxide. So you know that some effects of nitrous oxide could be through the opioid receptor. However, this is all uh, theories you haven't proved that. So it's better not to go too much into this detail because it's, it's, there's not many. If you want some um, Good review where you can find references to uh, proper pharmacological and physiological papers and manuscripts on these. There is a review that I've co authored with Prof. Dave Nutt. It's being published through the Drug Science Policy and Law, where we've reviewed the more scientific part on the actions of uh, nitrous oxide and poppers. So um, we're going to put it that into the into the chat and you can uh, download the paper is free and then from the paper you can find references and we also give a good overview on the science behind the behind it okay awesome thank you very much for that plenia um as fact, there's one other question which we'll come back to later with you someone said uh, where would nitrous be uh, ranked in a Professor Nutt's drugs harms chart. And of course, that is exactly the research you were doing, wasn't it? You're using Professor Nutt's framework to rank um, to rank nitrous. Actually, maybe um, before we pass back to Harry, could you say um, just a very little bit about, so where did uh, nitrous come in the um, hierarchy of, of drugs by harm? Okay, so for this, I can uh, get back to our uh, to my to my slides are you hear me am i i'm not muted sorry uh i can get back to my slides and share the um, I should, yeah good great thank you and sh i can share the yeah okay so i'm gonna start with this um this is the first graph produced by prof and collaborators in 2010 uh, that gained a lot of media attention. So 
this was produced to um, uh, type of uh, analysis called multi-criterion decision analysis. This is um, a type of uh, rankings. Uh, this is a way of producing rankings to decision making many, many uh, different types of questions, whether in politics in social sciences, and also so then uh, Prof. applied this to ranking to rank the harms of drugs um, with uh, with some of his collaborators. So what he did, he got these, uh, I think there's about 20 drugs here, if I'm not wrong. And they uh, did 16 uh, different categories. And in a group of specialists, there was a mediator. Uh, the mediator uh, talks about, let's um, decide, we, we decide to talk, start talking about one of the rankings. So let's say drugs, drug harms to the user, or it could be um, uh, the environmental situation or drug harms to the others, or which means to the family or the society around the people taking drug use. And then you, you, you find a, you, you, you say um, a rank from zero to a hundred being hundred, the most harmful and zero, the least harmful. So let's, um, give an example. So drug harms to user, okay? We know that heroin is super harmful to the user. That means that one person can easily have an overdose after one single shot of heroin. But uh, whereas tobacco, we know that it is not that harmful to the user in a, in a single session because people, you know, sometimes smoke for 50 years, they're still living, they have problems. But in a in a single session tends not to be super harmful to the user. So in this case, heroin would have an extremely high note, close to a hundred, when tobacco would have a low uh, those to a uh, low uh, note to 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 the to the person. So then uh, the specialist convene and each one gives a note or, or a score. To, to that drug that they're discussing about. And, and then it forms a consensus and then into uh, a 16 topic. Uh, each topic has um, a weight and then you end up having an ultimate uh, score for that drug. Then harms to users and harms to others, okay? So this, this graph was produced in 2010 and was published in the Lancet Journal, which is one of the biggest uh, medical journals. And it gained a lot of media attention because uh, alcohol obviously topped here, being very harm, harmful to, to the user and very harmful to others, especially because we know that amount of problems that a person uh, could could do once uh, is intoxicated by alcohol can can do to the others such as uh, traffic accidents or or even within the proper family. So this gained a lot of media attention. But in in this uh, particular research, when they done, it's missing uh, nitrous oxide and poppers because at that point there was they were not even discussed as drugs because they were not into the uh, debate of things. So not even being discussed as, as a harmful situation. So then uh, I was invited to uh, this panel with the group and we discussed, we added uh, poppers and nitrous oxide into this, um, into this uh, graph and apply the same, uh, the same criteria as we as they apply to the other drugs and actually these are the different uh topics that we discuss so mortality drug related mortality drug specific damage dependence 
So we know that, for example, magic mushrooms have a very low dopamine rate, whereas crack has a super high. So that's how you try to put the, the scores. So crime is a very important one, environmental damage. So nitrous oxide obviously was, we had a very good discussion on the envir environmental damage of nitrous oxide actually. But then, you know, you start to, to compare uh, whether the amount of uh, whippets we see in the streets are actually uh, important as an environmental damage. That's why it may have got a higher score than than other drugs, for example. Economic cost and harm to community, for example, okay? So then we added these two to the old drugs that have been already discussed. And they uh, were both uh, located all the way to the bottom of uh, the, the ranks. So they're not considered very harmful to users and not even to others. The only score where nitrous oxide and poppers had uh, something around the 50s was the uh, drug specific impaired mental function because they, these drugs are very intense in the short span that they are uh, actually having their effect. But on the other uh, oh, thank topics, you for, yeah. For that very much. Yeah. I might now, um, so we've got a very related question with Mom's actually okay. directed at Harry. So, Harry, um, firstly, you might have some follow ups on what Pino has been saying, so please go through these. Also, someone had asked, and you may or may not be able to answer this, um, is what the perception of nitrous oxide is within the ANCD. So, I wonder if you could have a crack at that, if you're allowed to report on such things, then maybe, I don't know if you've got anything else to follow up on what Plinio has been saying. Uh, while I'm no longer a, a member of the ACMD, uh, my term of uh, appointment ended a couple of years ago, so I can't comment. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that they are either undertaking or about to undertake the review, which was at the request of how many home secretaries ago, but Pretty Patel, a few home secretaries ago, my, my personal opinion is it's probably not a priority for them at the moment, uh, but may, maybe just thinking ahead with regards to whether that could lead to placement of nitrous oxide under the Misuse of Drugs Act, uh, then I think it's important to keep in mind that decisions like that are ultimately the responsibility of the Home Secretary, so regardless of what the uh, uh, ACMD reports, then it's up to the Home Secretary. It's 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 her his or her decision to decide what to do around that. But I think more broadly, Plinio has been talking about some of the harms, and I think we we both agree that relative to other drugs, that it's a relatively harmless drug. But often, when decisions around drug control is made, then things such as the toxicology, for example, or the number of deaths are just one element. So you have to look at the whole societal picture. And I think there's something interesting about nitrous oxide, particularly practices of use. So it's been associated, for example, with high level of health harms in young people. So young people with neuro neurological problems, sometimes irreversible, uh, but uh, thankfully not in all cases. Uh, for those of you in the UK, you might remember a debate back in 2020, which was instigated by the Labour MP Rosie Duffield, and she'd uh, based in Canterbury, and she was calling at the time for nitrous oxide to be placed under the Misuse of Drugs Act. But that debate in Westminster was a, not a great deal of that debate, was actually focused on the health harms. It was more on the perceived social harms. So it was about the litter, the environmental effects, drug use practices such as inhaling whilst uh, driving, for example. It was about perceived antisocial behaviour and the response of, of neighbours and community members to young people gathering in parks and street corners as neighbours are always worried about. So I think things like that also resonate with regards to drug control decisions. So, uh, you know, whereas Plinio's chart is, is, is useful and makes for a good discussion point, I think information like that is probably used less in decision making around policy than than perhaps people might realize.
Okay, that's great. Thank you, Harry. And actually, I've got, we've got a couple more questions. So one thing is, uh, Fiona Mission Movie is on the MC, ACMB currently, and it's on the Nitrous Working Group. I said it has just met for the first time, so that tells us there is some level of um, interest. Um, yeah, just to add, James, um, in September 2021, Briti Patel uh, asked the ACMD for a review on nitrous oxide, right? Mm -hmm. And since then, there hasn't been a, a reply on it. Fiona can uh, correct, it, correct me if I'm wrong. And then there is, so we understand that the ACMD is on ongoing, on ongoing discussions. Uh, about the uh, what would be the their yeah. conclusion to to the question made by the Home Office on September twenty twenty one. But but uh, overall evidence around the harms has not significantly changed since the last review was done in two thousand and sixteen. That there will be some additional data around calls to poison centres, for example but deaths haven't changed. It'd be very interesting to hear from those medics and clinicians, both in the UK and internationally about serious neurological presentations, but the state of the science has not really changed greatly since 2016. So from a purely technical perspective, then there probably isn't grounds for controlling nitrous oxide, but drug policy reflects social attitudes towards drugs as well. So I think, you know, that's why I was trying to suggest before that if nitrous oxide is controlled in the UK, it might be for other reasons than toxicology. Okay, I've actually got one other question, which I'm, I'm not sure either of you have, but Fiona Mishman again asked in the Q&A, she said, we are finding some evidence, the annual English festival survey that nitrous use may have peaked before the pandemic. Do you think so from your own research networks or other sources? And if yes, why would that be? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I mentioned the school's drug survey before, 11 to 15 year olds in England, and there was quite a notable decrease in use. Now, and obviously that's going to be affected by COVID and the fact that this is a social drug and particularly for younger teens, then this is something that they wouldn't really undertake in their own homes. They rely on social interactions to do that. But other research that we've been doing, qualitative research, which Fiona will be aware of, uh, with young people in, in different settings, suggests that perhaps there's changes in attitudes, that perhaps uh, nitrous oxide is now a drug which is associated with younger people, so younger teens. So we were focusing on uh, 18 to 25 year olds, for example. And it's definitely a drug which doesn't have the same cultural cachet as it might have done a few years ago. It's, it's certainly perceived as a, a younger person's drug. So I'd agree with Fiona on, on her point there. Okay. Although, oh, sorry, carry to, on. Carry on, carry on. sorry to add to that though, that is just one indicator of use. I think if you look at other indicators of use, such as discarded canisters, and maybe we'd want to talk about that uh, in a moment, then it seems just as popular as ever. Uh, people would have seen all the photos from the Notting Hill Carnival, from Pride festivals, or even just walking through the streets on a Sunday morning in, in Liverpool city centre. So levels of littering are still just as high. Uh, so I suppose it depends on what indicator of use you actually look at. Okay, for, yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, and actually, I think we'll, we're moving towards the end of the harms part of it, and I think I'll try and move some of the harm reductions in a bit. But while we're there, we haven't talked about the environment all that much. Um, so we have, you know, did mention about the production process and um, uh, chemicals which destroy the ozone, I believe, being released, which I didn't know about. So that is obviously most concerning. And then there is also this interesting change there has been where previously people used the very small whippets and, and you know, when I lived in London, they were absolutely everywhere, you know, random curbside, it looked like someone had emptied an entire carrier bag or possibly people sitting in a car had got through an entire box's worth. And then we've had this interesting move and I saw some good stuff in the chat earlier about this move from the small to the large um, canisters. And, you know, small ones, I guess, worse from a littering point of view larger ones, perhaps worse from an acute high level usage point of view. And again, Steve Rolls, who kind of gave me some thought provoking pointers when we we're discussing this beforehand, he had mentioned, you know, the dangers of these larger ones. 
Um, so yeah, I don't know if uh, uh, I've, uh, Harry or Pliny, I've got anything to, more to say on the environmental harm than possibly related as well to this switch from smaller to larger canisters. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've got a few things to say. I'm sure Plinio has as well. Just on the global warming issue, it's, in, it's important to note that environmentalists are concerned about that, not from the recreational drug use perspective, but from things such as fertilizers, you know, animal uh, uh, and, and fertilizers used in ag agriculture. And there's, there's a big movement to try and address that about management of those fertilizers. So with regards to the littering issue, this is interesting because this is where drug policy interacts with other public policy as well. Because you have to think about, well, why, why is this such a littering problem? Well, first of all, people shouldn't litter. <laughs> you know, they can take the canisters, they can put them, they take them home with them, they can put them in the bin, they can take them to their local recycling centre. If the local recycling centre doesn't take them, they can take them to recycle from the scrapyard, get a few pence in each canister. So there's a personal responsibility issue here, absolutely. But then if we think about more broadly uh, with regards to uh, littering strategies in different countries. So here in the UK, we had the Litter Strategy 2017, which was meant to really focus attention on the big issue of littering in, in all its forms across the UK. But, but since then, uh, for example, local recycling and uh, uh, waste teams, they've seen their budgets cut. Uh, in litter enforcement offices and city centres and town centres, they've been lost or otherwise they've been focused on revenue generation. Uh, there's been a reduction in the volume of bins to encourage people to recycle. So I think one of the issues around littering is people have fewer opportunities to dispose of canisters and fewer opportunities to recycle. So, you know, it's, it's absolutely fine to go and recycle these, these products, but whether people will do because of worries about legality and illegality, whether the centres will take them because the centres due to cuts have had to uh, focus on particular products. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, in terms of, harm reduction in educational messages. It's not just about personal safety, it's also about littering as well. It's a, littering is an issue which really brings out the, the inner drug warrior in me. Um, yeah, indeed, uh, indeed and like, and there was quite a while, I must admit, before um, there were more reports of the acute use, I kind of used to say, you know, littering is the only problem with NOS when it's with nitrous, when it seemed that moderate recreational use was common, it's near. Now we, we are seeing other uh, health risk issues as well. Uh, Plinio, have you got anything you wish to add on the environmental side? Yes, uh, there's one uh, piece of data which is a bit concerning that I've, I've dug out that on Notting Hill Carnival this year, um, on canisters, mainly the big ones found, they collected 3.5 tons of canisters of nitrous oxide. And that's a lot. Um, until then, I would say that the, the whippets, I wouldn't consider a huge environmental problem. For example, if we compare to the amount of uh, trash that we make from alcohol products or from tobacco, the amount of whippets is marginal. You know, if you think that one beer produces a big uh, bottle, uh, the amount, even even though we find in the street, but we don't even think about the amount of uh, alcohol bottles we find in the street. We've seen so we we see so much that we just don't even notice anymore. And as as Harry said, people tend to to recycle it, but we know that recycling also costs a lot to the environment, although it's a good practice, but it's still producing trash. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's that's how I situate myself. But then after seeing this 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 piece of data that 3.5 tons of canisters were collected just in two days of uh, Notting Hill Street Party, and that's that's quite alarming. So and then we can maybe bring uh, to speak about on this uh, big canister issue. Uh, is that okay, James? Yeah, actually, one thing I'll uh, yeah. say, when we move on to big canisters, I guess one thing I'd like to disambiguate what we might mean by the big canisters. So 
roughly, I mean, if I'd thought ahead, I could have walked along the street, probably found one of the little ones and said, by the little ones, we mean this, but you know, they're about so big, um, come in boxes of about 30 or so. And a few years ago, they used to be what you'd standardly see around, but it seems they're being replaced by, and by the big ones, um, I've never seen one of these in Russia, but they're about, yeah, you big, is that about right? And they yeah. carry, they carry exactly 17 times of the amount of gas yeah. than inside of uh, metal. Very quickly, before we talk about those meaning the big ones, in fact, I thought previously thought something else was meant by the big ones, since certainly at um, there's some illegal rave, free parties, illegal raves, etc. You see people with like industrial size ones, which were supposedly stolen from hospitals. Um, I don't know if they're, I mean, I'm sure it would only be uh, um, anecdotal evidence, but is there from Harry or Pliny, have you heard of these big hospital supposedly stolen NHS nitrous cylinders being used recreationally? Yeah, yeah, yes, you know, but 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 not exclusively. So you would see these more commonly before the introduction of the 2016 Psychoactive Substances Act. So if you went out on a city centre on a Saturday, Friday or Saturday night before the act, then people were uh, often dispensing from the large canisters. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that was before, you know, uh, 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 it was controlled under the Psychoactive Substances Act. There are some concerns uh, about the diversion, not necessarily from hospitals, but from industry like the automobile industry, garages and things like that, where nitrous oxide can be used uh, in terms of souping up engines and performance cars, etc. But they, that, they are often manufactured under different conditions and, and can contain some harmful additives. But I think it's, it's a much less common practice than perhaps it was five or ten years ago. I mean, why would why would you need to buy one of those massive canisters when you could get exactly as you're saying something like that and stick it in your bag and get 30 or 40 times the amount as a small weapon? There's no need for them, really. Mm -hmm. And one thing to clarify, and this kind of will intrude on a later conversation about policy options, but you said you saw the really big ones a lot before the 2016 psychoactives bill. Am I guessing that the psychoactive bill makes it illegal to sell, not illegal to possess. And so when you've got an absolutely massive one, you're very obviously selling it. Whereas what we now describe as the big ones, the is it smart whip? People in the chat are saying a smart whip yeah. is the main brand of these. This you can at least pretend you're whipping some cream unless you're wheeling along a big NHS cylinder along the road. Yeah, so the, so there's the different suppliers, uh, a lot of them are based in the Netherlands. Uh, but they have UK partners, UK distribution partners, and some of those UK distribution partners sell, you know, legitimate catering supply companies. But it's quite obvious from the parent company, the parent manufacturers, who they're targeting on this. And indeed, some of the big uh, online retailers, Amazon and eBay, are also now selling the larger products, uh, whereas before it was almost exclusively the, the smaller whippets. And interestingly, in in the Netherlands, they 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 have a they've had a, 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 a they're a few years ahead of us on this issue. So, with regards to data from the National Poisons Agency uh, in the Netherlands, for example, there's been a sharp and in France as well. There's been a sharp increase in the number of poisoning presentations, and that's been almost exclusively associated with the emergence of the larger canisters. And despite a few false starts, it does seem to be that the, the Dutch government is going to now more formally control uh, nitrous oxide. And that's largely a result of the emergence of these larger canisters, Al although in typically pragmatic Dutch style, there probably won't be enforcement of a, of a possession offence. OK, great. Thank you. Um, before we move on to the harm reduction side, I don't know if Pinio, you have anything to say on harms and the big canister issue? Yeah, just quickly. Um, yeah, it's definitely uh, there is a correlation on the number of presentations with uh, these side effects of nitrous oxide with the emergence of big canisters. Okay, so that's that's clear and that's happening now. And um, if we do a quick search, there has been. A, people are more concerned about uh, the symptoms that they're having after heavy consumption. But also, I think heavy consumption is also uh, kind of a new thing as well. You know, I wouldn't say that 
before it was that amount. Now we are seeing people that take 10 smart whips a day, which is the big one, or even five, which is a lot, a lot, a lot. It's like basically just doing it for the whole day. And then this is a kind of a new, new, new type of thing. But so I think Harry can, um, can uh, tell that, that uh, better than I do, but we know in drug consumption that if you have easy, easier availability, for example, I, I would relate that to the super, super strong lager situations where you have a kind of beer which has a, a huge amount of alcohol, uh, not huge, but a, a bigger amount of alcohol tends to be related to a higher situation of, of, of harms to the users and then as a public health uh, measurement, you limit the amount of alcohol containing in a can, and then you tend to have less, uh, it tends to be harder to, to, to provoke the, the side effects that you don't wanna have. So these things kind of talk to me more or less, they seem uh, kind of relatable. Mm -hmm. Dennis, you've got another, we're, we're, we keep on nearly getting onto harm reduction, then I have something else that me or someone else wants to ask. I promise we will see, but so, so a good question from Carenza Moore in the Q&A, asking um, what we know about the polydrug profiles of nitrous users. And I think this is interesting this, to my mind, and I wonder if your own evidence and sources will agree. There is a profile of, you know, a polydrug user who uses the recreational repertoire of things like ecstasy and cocaine and ketamine, who goes to raves and festivals. Then there's the other, perhaps younger person who doesn't use many other drugs, perhaps with their age, it's harder to get them. And there's certainly um, anecdotally, I've heard, um, and, and something I've read as well, um, uh, in uh, young members of Muslim communities using nitrous as it's not seen to be haram, uh, whereas other rec whereas recreation, other recreational drugs might be. So I don't know if Harry or Plinio have got anything more on the drug repertoires of young, NOS, young nitrous users. No, I think you've summarised it well there, James. Uh, I, I think yes, for your you know your regular regular nighttime, uh, nightlife patrons and uh, users of other substances, then it's a complementary drug, uh, used on its own, but also to, to amplify uh, in, a, in a synergistic way with other substances. I, I think you're probably right that for the 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 younger users, so maybe the under 18s, the school children, for example, it would be used on its own and sometimes as a replacement for alcohol or a substitute for alcohol, which is, which in many cases actually diff more difficult to obtain uh, than nitrous oxide perversely, being as one's a controlled drug and one, one isn't. Uh, but yeah, it, it, you know, in, in terms of patterns and profiles of use, not too different from other types of substances. It, it, important to note that again, like other substances though, we've, we've focused a lot on heavy use and the more harmful use. Most people report uh, using nitrous across a small number of episodes across the year, a handful of episodes. That's the typical use pattern. That's the typical use behavior. So just a few occasions across the year. Thank you. And so now, finally, finally, maybe let's move on to um, harm reduction. Maybe I'll start with you again, Harry, before moving back to Plinier. So where would you start? I mean, I guess you kind of mentioned there the, uh, the difference between your heavy and your standard recreational user, which might be a large part of the harm reduction. Maybe could you give something on how we should go, maybe as society, as practitioners or as consumers, how one would go about reducing the harms of nitrous? Well, I think there's lots of good generic messages. So around dosages, around frequency of use, that applies to all, all drugs and drug mixing, how that can affect you not only on a physiological basis, but in terms of risk taking and decision making. But that, that's general information that which is useful for all young, young people to know. Uh, there's also a discussion to be had around administration methods, although it might seem obvious to us, perhaps it doesn't, but you know, don't stick a bag of nitrous oxide over your head. Don't use an anesthetic mask or things like that. Uh, uh, it's also because it's a gas, people might also think that it's similar to oxygen. You still need to breathe as Pino was talking about. And luckily taken from the balloon, as he mentioned, it means that once you finish, you'll take a, you'll take a, 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 a breath as well. Uh, the, the patterns that most people are using, it can cause dizziness. Uh, it can cause people to faint or fall over, you know, just really quite minor things. 
uh, but which could be important in particular contexts. So certainly don't drive and use this substance. Uh, probably like many people in, in the chat and, and online, I've seen people inhale from balloons and you know chuck the canisters out whilst driving or a passenger as well. So I think there's discussions around that. Uh, and again, other things as well that uh, the harms of drug can also, can also be related to social relationships. So uh, how drugs can cause friends to fall out, uh, how it can cause tension within families, you know, some of these low level things which actually are quite important, particularly for young people. And then just looking at the chat as well about perhaps the more heavy patterns of use. And one of the issues around some of the neurological symptoms is there's a really low level of awareness of the early signs of those symptoms. And there's work done by Adam Winstock and Jason Ferris based on the Global Drug Survey. And they estimated that for every 10% increase in nitrous oxide dose per episode, there's about four or 5% increased probability of suffering adverse or reporting adverse neurological symptoms. And there's a really low level of awareness here. And I think that's probably reflective of the poor state of drugs education that we have in the UK at the moment, but things such as tingling, numbness, unusual sensations, that should be a sign, one, to stop use or certainly to reduce use. But if it's prolonged to then uh, talk to a doctor about this, a family doctor or drugs worker, there's interesting discussions around the use of vitamin B12 supplements because, you know, Plinio was talking about some of the adverse neurological effects are a result of inactivation or uh, reduced uh, B12 function. There's not actually a lot of evidence which suggests that consumer B12 supplements are actually beneficial. And I think this has partly come from the fact that this would be a first line treatment in the clinic and hospitals, really high dose IV or oral B12. But other case study reviews have shown that some of these neurological symptoms emerge within normal B12 ranges. You know, so it's not, we're still finding, trying to find out a lot about the mechanisms here. And uh, some of the over-the-counter B12 uh, supplements might simply, you know, not be having an impact. I, I, you know, the message should be dose and frequency, I think, rather than relying on unproven supplements. For me, that's an important harm reduction message. Uh, there's also a harm reduction message and training message orientated towards drug workers, but also clinicians as well. You know, as I said in my opening remarks that I think one of the reasons why there was this big media focus on nitrous oxide in the UK over the summer is that clinicians started asking questions about nitrous oxide. You know, uh, people were presenting and then they were starting to ask, you know, do you have a history of nitrous oxide use? So I think we need to be, uh, uh, get better for medical practitioners and drug workers. And I'm a researcher, so good data collection. Let's get some good data collection around this as well. Awesome, thank you. Harry, um, Plinio, do you have anything on the harm reduction side? Uh, yes, um, I would say I, I completely agree with Harry. Number one, uh, harm reduction measurement should be education, right? So we should uh, basically tell kids how uh, these drugs should be handled in, in case they encounter in their life and and what should they do and how should they do and the amount they should do if they want and if that's if that's their the judgment so education is number one another harm reduction uh, measurement that could have been put in place is actually put uh messages in in these bottles uh about uh you know the as you do with tobacco, uh, doing this uh, in a, have, a heavy uh, frequency might cause you numbness, tingling, and this could lead to paresthesia, which is a medical uh, emergency condition. So this kind of uh, uh, measurements that we can uh, take from other substances such as tobacco and alcohol, we could also apply to, to nitrous oxide. One thing I've seen 
is that the British Compressed Gas Association, I don't know how uh, important they are and what they actually stand for and, uh, and how do they control the, the market, but the British Compressed Gas Association made a plea to our Home Office uh, Minister, Suella Braverman, urging her to scrap direct consumer retail uh, of nitrous oxide. Uh, so the organization that probably has many uh, gas making companies wants to ban direct to consumer uh, sales of the product. So that's quite interesting. I don't know what's the impact of that. Uh, um, and also what's the thinking behind of that. But we also know that once you take out from the regulated market, the next thing that appears is the illegal market. Then, then uh, obviously with the illegal market comes all the uh, consequences that we already know that. So it's a, it's a very uh, fluid situation uh, right now. And also being now the second most used substance uh, probably in the UK. So yeah, I would say it's time to have uh, s straight and direct harm reduction messages to, to the use of nitric oxide. So to nitrous oxide, so uh, it doesn't lead to prohibition and all, all these things that we already know. Yes, some, some good points there, Plinio. So with the British Compressed Gas Association, uh, they, they are quite influential from an in industry perspective. And if I remember correctly, they, they had a really important role to play with regards to volatile substance use more generally. So glues and gases in terms of messaging, project, uh, product formulation, working with retailers. You know, and I, I do think there's probably, but personally, I think there's more that can be done on the supply side of things rather than the criminalization of user things, perhaps an obvious thing to say. I think what they're suggesting is, is worth exploring, but I think there'll be a high regulatory burden. So, for example, how do you distinguish between an individual purchaser and a legitimate uh, purchaser? Uh, you know, or, already under the Psychoactive Substances Act, uh, even though uh, even though there's exempted uses, it's really difficult to prove in court that those sales have been reckless and in inverted commas, you know, the legal term which is sometimes used. So it's difficult to bring those those forward. But you mentioned that the harm reduction advice uh, uh, direct to consumers. I think that would be difficult at the moment because from a policy and legal perspective, it suggests human consumption and therefore retailers would be prosecuted for that. Uh, but thinking about France, for example, uh, in June of 2021, they introduced age restrictions around direct to consumer sales. So it's, it's still allowed, but you have to provide evidence of age. And I know there's ways to circumvent that, but it's the first step. But all packages also have health and harm information on there as well. So it can be done, it can be done, but I suspect in France, maybe levels of use are lower than in, in, in the UK uh, and uh, perhaps reflected, uh, reflective of some European pragmatism and I'm not really sure whether uh, UK government will be receptive to that sort of thing. Okay, thank you very much for that. And I wonder if I'd just like to add at this point, looking at, um, the names and emails in the group, it seems you've got lots and lots of drugs workers, lots and lots of local government, quite a lot of police. And then the questions being asked, I think it, people are really, really interested in the harms and the harm reductions. And I think it's been quite brilliant and comprehensive what you've given us so far on that. Um, I'm looking to see if there's anything directly harm related, harm reduction related in the questions before we move on at all. We're having lots of comments about these big smart whips and these increasing use. And I think that's a major theme we have today. We've got other harms, someone saying young people talking about migraines the day after a night of, he a night of heavy use. Um, and that's it. And another interesting point as well as uh, mentioning who uses them, what other drugs they use. Um, footballers like getting photographed with nitrous, don't they? And I guess 
if you're an athlete and want to use a drug, you can see why they use this one, which doesn't show up in blood tests, and is they may rightly or wrongly assume won't do much to their athletic performance. Um, so before, so I think that maybe this might be a good time to move on to policy, as you were kind of touching on it there, is the best way, you know, if we're talking about reducing harms, okay, well, can we set policies to reduce harms? It's great that we've got at least, um, one ACMD committee member um, in, in, in the room as well for this. And so very interesting if we have any more, uh, any more input into the chats from there. Um, so first, I think maybe I will again start with uh, Harry here. So Harry, have you got anything you'd like to lead on on the policy side? Yes, so I think when we have policy discussions, I, I think a, a general comment, we can get a bit idealistic about what we'd like ideal policy to be. And that might include, for example, legal and regulated supply. And that's fine, that's a general discussion. But I think it's really important to focus on workable solutions. And by workable solutions are ones which are acceptable to the Home Office in the UK and policymakers internationally. So potentially working within the, the powers and regulations and restrictions that we have already. It's, it's my, my, my personal view that I don't think if we're interested in reducing harms to users, that uh, a possession offence, which would be introduced with placing nitrous oxide under the Mis Misuse of Drugs Act, that wouldn't be an effective way to do that. That might be an effective way of clamping down on supply, for example. But in terms of overall harms, I don't think it would have much impact. You know, we have a wealth of evidence that that's not the case. And it would be concerned for, for a number of reasons is that uh, firstly, these products are available internationally from territories where they're not restricted. And it's already very easy to import uh, the larger canisters. Uh, I can't see that changing. I think it might also lead to people being less likely to come forward for support. And as we've seen with other drugs as well, that although the harms associated with a controlled drug, in this case, nitrous oxide might decrease because people desire intoxication, they des desire a high, it might mean substitution with potentially more harmful, harmful drugs. So my personal preference is definitely to focus on the supply side of things and the retail side of things. Now, I'll have to think through how you would do that, because I recognize how complicated it is. But that's why I'm, I'm very interested in what in what the British Compressed Gas Association was saying. Is there something workable about the direct to consumer sales of a uh, large number of, pro of, 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 of of supplies, but also the larger products as well? You know, is there a way of doing that? And even with those sorts of regulations and restrictions, there's still going to be ways around that. But it could be potentially a way to reduce the overall bar burden of harm, re reduce potentially the exposure to these uh, higher volume uh, products without exposing consumers to the indirect harms of the criminal justice system. Uh, Pliny, I'm not sure if you've got any thoughts on this as well. Um, no, I, I'm, I just agree with you. I think um, I would rather just uh, agree on this part because that's not really my speciality. But yeah, uh, I have opinions and my opinions are in line with what, what you said for sure. Yeah, and you know, uh, we've, we've mentioned the fact that the, 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 uh, it, it's under review by the ACMD at, at, at the moment. Uh, and you know, obviously we, we can't second guess what that review will find, but you know, again, just a gut feeling that in the back of my mind that I think perhaps the Home Office, the Home Secretary, whoever that will be, will be minded to control it under the Misuse of Drugs Act. But again, not necessarily for those health harms, but because this is a really visible form of substance use and a really visible form of drug use practice. And so a government can easily demonstrate to the community, to the electorate, that it's getting tough on drugs, it's addressing a really visible drugs issue, which has been in all the papers. It's kind of a relatively easy win. And I know there's uh, unexpected and, and uh, unanticipated effects of that, but 
you know, that, that that's my feeling that perhaps the, the decisions will be taken on that basis, but there'll be careful focus and selection of evidence, for, for example, that the, the severe uh, neurological cases and the relatively small number of deaths. Don't discount the power of littering and things like that. Littering could be really important here. Awesome, thank you. I said, well, my fo a follow up question on the policy side. So, as clear as something, you know, if the ACMD are convening on it, there's clearly something, you know, where there's political interest here. You've talked about it being an issue in the Netherlands and there being a hopefully progressive policy e initiative in the pipeline. Um, earlier, I think it was, um, I forget where, um, but there's also, I believe, some levels of recreational use in America. Do we have anywhere else that you are aware of trying to find a policy response to this? Uh, I'm not aware of, of aware of this in, in countries. So in the Netherlands, uh, you know, it's coming under formal control, but there's the uh, again the possession offence probably won't be enforced. You know, in typical Dutch style as they as they do with with cannabis as well. Uh, in France, they've they focused on, on the retail side of things. In the in the USA, it's not federally controlled, so it's not a scheduled drug, but different states and cities have implemented uh, different approaches. Some have, uh, have, have had like bizarre manifestations. So I think it's in New York City. Uh, you had to present ID to buy whipped cream from the grocery. And that's not even nitrous oxide, just, just whipped cream itself. I'm not aware of, uh, smart regulation internationally that hasn't taken the approach of either formal drug control or consumer restrictions or, or supply restrictions. I, I'm not aware of where there's regulated sales for rec so-called recreational use mm. uh, in because it's not a, it's not a controlled drug at uh, uh, UN level so it's not in the drug conventions or drug schedules so there's not really an imperative for member states to actually look at this unless it's a big public health issue and it's only really an emerging public health issue in a small number of European and North American states. Australia are doing some uh, interesting policy work at the moment around uh, cannabis and decriminalization for example but, but levels of use over there are really low uh, so it's not had the same impact as it has in, in Western Europe so uh, I can't think of any examples. If, if anybody else can stick it in the chat, I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to hear what else is happening. So I've got one more follow-up again before I think we we'll, might then move to the remaining questions in the Q and A. So any more questions you've got, which you wish to be asked, do chuck them in the Q and A. Since I'm going to start kind of going through them. Um, my final question is, and it's, I'm slightly worried you might have already answered this while I was typing something in the chat and lost concentration, but. Do you consider there may have been positive consequences or unintended consequences of including nitrous on the 2016 uh, Psychoactives Act? Uh, that, that, that's, a big, that's a big question. So could, could you reframe that, please? Reframe that is that we, we, I guess we've talked about current forms of use and the you know most problematic aspect being these bigger canisters. Are there any way that those could be a result of the Psychoactives Act, or if it had never been, you know, if it was still allowed and there were still you know shops and still stalls selling it, in, you know, at festivals, do you, do you consider we'd be in a better or worse position regarding harm? Uh, I, I, I don't think it would have made much difference, to be honest. I, I think uh, the Psychoactive Substances Act has been effective in reducing the availability of many kinds of new psychoactive substances. But I think because nitrous oxide is a, it's a medicinal product and it's also exempted under food, uh, uh, food regulations as well, that I, I can't envisage if the Nit if the Psychoactive Substances Act didn't exist, there wouldn't be regulation which would permit uh, license and regulate use for intoxicating purposes. So use would still be subject to those medicines and food regulations. And I suspect that uh, you know if nobody conceptualized the Psychoactive Substances Act, it would already be under the Misuse of Drugs Act or there would have been a, a more prosecutions under the 
uh, Medicines Act or, or the Food Standards uh, Agency powers as well. So it's a case of we don't really know, but it could have been actually worse if it wasn't placed under the Psychoactive Substances Act because it would have been potentially a possession of fence by now. Noted in a very quick, I think this might be mentioned earlier um, regarding a question here. There is no specific law against driving after using nitrous, is there? Um, yeah, I, I just can I can add something on that. Um, some people concern about having to do a test when and found in the blood or in the urine that the person has used uh, the balloons in last day or last week. Um, I don't I don't know any test that can detect the use of nitrous oxide through blood or urine because to to detect a substance either blood or urine you have to know um, a metabolite of the substance that you're looking for so for example uh, metabolite of THC or of cocaine they're well known and then through a chemical test you can easily detect the, uh, the concentration of that in blood or in urine. Whereas for nitrous oxide, it's a gas. And even being a gas, there is, I don't, I haven't heard of a metabolite that traces back to the use of nitrous oxide. So until you have a metabolite that you can actually be 100% uh, sure that that traces back to the use of nitrous oxide, you can't really detect into blood in urine. So my answer yeah. is no. Yeah, so, so the, the, you're right. There isn't that specific offence. And somebody's just, Asher's just noted in the chat. So it, it, would, it would fall under the general uh, road, is it the Road Traffic Act, about dangerous driving. And uh, I, I think even, even the, I suppose it depends on the driving behaviour rather than the intoxication through nitrous oxide. Because as you know, Plinio has just said, you can't detect that. But if it has an impact on the quality and safety of driving, perhaps that is something that the police would focus on. And maybe, for example, you know, I, I don't know, maybe the evidence of empty canisters or balloons could be used as part of that process. Awesome, thank you. So I think now, just got a few more questions. Maybe we'll do it in a kind of a fingers on buzzers quick fire. Since there's lots of these, I think, fairly, uh, you know, almost like fact based ones. Um, quick one from, I think this is a Plinio question, I'd imagine, from, and it's um, from Marcel Shamshum. In terms of pharmacology and toxicology, to what extent is this different from nitric oxide NO? Okay, so th these are two different uh, molecules and uh, they have completely different chemistry and, and physiological responses. Nitric oxide is an endogenous substance. That means that we actively make that in our system and this is metabolized within our system in our normal physiology. So the um, metabolism of arginine will lead to the production of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide will have direct act in, in the vessels and nitric oxide will uh, lead to vasodilation. This is one of the, of the uh, pharmacological and physiological effects of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide also works as a um, neurotransmitter and, 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 and therefore transmit uh, information into uh, um, neurons. So that, that uh, characterized as a neurotransmitter. Whereas nitric, nitrous oxide is N2O, is a different substance that has a different pharmacology, which is already not very well known. And the pharmacology of nitrous oxide could lead to, uh, in some extent, to the release of nitric oxide. This is one of the theories, but this is not um, confirmed. And we talk about this, me and Profna, on the review we've done. So if you wanna give a, a deeper, deeper read into that, you can find it in the paper. Awesome, thank you. And very quickly, I think probably again to Plinio, 
Um, this is about the different risks. So earlier we were talking about the fact of the, the medical use where it's still used and you know, acute he uh, health in fact, my, my only father had a fall recently, he said he was, I was telling him about, I was doing this webinar, I said, oh, I was giving this stuff in the ambulance and he said it did the trick. Um, and obviously, you know, someone mentioned in the chat earlier having used it during childbirth. So, but I believe medically you're given it mixed with oxygen. So you're given nitrous and oxygen in the face mask. And that's lower risk due to also being given oxygen. Is, is that correct? Yeah, that's uh, there is formulations uh, sold into commercial, uh, so that's commercial formulations. And these are used by anesthetists. And these anesthetists, they tend to do a mixture with uh, oxygen and nitrous oxide mm -hmm. to to uh, to make oxygen available because in 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 an in anesthesia circumstance, you use into a mask, whereas in a recreational setting, you use into the balloon. With the balloon, the nose is still uh, uh, free to to breathe. So mm -hmm. as much as much as you can inhale from a balloon, as soon as you remove the balloon from the mouth, the next inhale would be air, and therefore will contain oxygen. And with a mask in an in an anesthetic uh, scenario that mixture will contain oxygen. Okay, the next one I think might be more, Harry, it might be both of you as well. In terms of uh, harm minimization advice, would nitrous fit into the same category as solvents, gases? And to give a small amount of you know, background is that when I was moving from primary to secondary school in the mid nineties, I was warned about people sniffing gas and sniffing glue. And I believe in the 80s and early 90s, that was a typical recreational uh, drug pattern. Although it had stopped by the time I got to secondary school, I was warned a bit and I saw it there. Um, so Mr. Harry, I don't know, uh, you know, it's quite one interesting point is, is nitrous the new sniffing glue? Since people don't really sniff glue anymore, has it kind of socially replaced it? And how does it rank with harm? Since I actually, since it's not really done at the moment, I couldn't tell you much about the harms of sniffing glue. Uh, yeah, I just want to challenge you there, James. Uh, mm -hmm. Sniffing gas and inhaling gas and solvents has not gone away. Mm -hmm. It's the second most popular re popularly reported drug mm -hmm. by 11 to 15 year olds mm -hmm. in England after mm -hmm. cannabis. And for when young people initiate substance use before the age of 11, it's gases and solvents. It's, it's never gone away, but I think we don't talk about it very much because it's an unfashionable drug. But precise, it seems as a, in inverted commas, a dirty drug and therefore associations with who uses it. And annually, there's the number of deaths associated with volatile substances is approaching the number of ecstasy related deaths in England. But we never talk about that, of course, because it tends to be older people perhaps older people who are who uh, have additional needs and are stigmatized in, in other ways. So I, I think there does need to be separate strands of harm reduction information because, you know, as Plinio was talking about there, that perhaps methods of administration are slightly different. And I would argue that perhaps the acute risk of harm is greater for gases and solvents. Uh, but in, in terms of in terms of reducing harms around gases and solvents, for example, there's a there's a bigger issue that, you know, exactly as you were suggesting there, James, it's fallen off the radar. And, and there are some great organizations, there's Resolve, for example, who I know are, are on the chat, and there's other, there's other organizations who do work around this, but it's almost like a forgotten drug. And I would also probably suspect that in most drug services in the UK, there's probably very little expertise around this. Uh, so, yeah, let's not discount glues and gases and solvents. Yeah, Lisa's just put in a, the website in the chat. Also, I think, by the way, lesson to me, yeah. lesson to uh, James, other James from drug science, also new to him. So fascinating to know and clearly something we, we should know. So thank you for that. And Plinio, do you have something there? Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, these gases, uh, usually uh, the volatile substances, they come from a liquid which is volatile, right? So if, if we think, for example, ether is one of them, and also butane, and also toluene, which is the, the principle from the glue. And these, uh, these solvents, they're super dangerous once you swallow it. 
which is something that you don't see, for example, with uh, nitrous oxide, you don't have the kind of uh, immediate emergency uh, of, uh, you know, of the acute intake of uh, nitrous oxide. But if you swallow a big sip or, or even a small sip of chloroform, you have to go to hospital straight away. And, and also uh, ether being super, super dangerous. So the volatile substances have uh, a bit of a different pattern of uh, harm compared to nitrous oxide. So although they both rank low on the, on the scale that we've done uh, recently, they have a, a different uh, type of uh, possible harm. And there are many substances, uh, volatile substances, as I, as I told, ether, toluene, chloroform, butane, even helium, we see a lot. And, and, and in, well, I'm from Latin America and it was very common. Mm -hmm. And it still is to see uh, people in uh, the, the young uh, people doing that on, on the street lights because it's very easy to find in, uh, in shops where you have uh, cleaning and removal of substances that will contain dissolvent. So that's how people get hold of it very cheap and very easily. Yeah, awesome, thank you much for that. So next question, um, I actually saw this one followed up upon in the chat, so I'll ask it now. I read a while ago, there's a potential issue of mistaking small carbon dioxide cylinders with nitrous. Is there any evidence of this for either of you who wish to have a bite at that apple? Uh, I'm sure it happens, but but in terms of contribution to the overall burden of, of harm, it's you know it's, it's it's probably a relatively minor issue. Uh, there's always going to be a case of mistaken identity with substances, but it's not something that's good, that I, I'm particularly aware of. Cool. Uh, next question is: blah, 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 blah. Um, Is there additional risks to young people's brains which we don't see in adults? I don't know, maybe this is Plinio to start with. I haven't uh, read any evidence on that. And also, if there were, these drugs wouldn't be used in kids as anesthetics. So I don't think it's, uh, I haven't seen, so I would say no. Yes, so with regards to the neurological presentations to hospitals, so reviews of case studies suggest that the, the typical patient, if there is a typical patient, is usually in their mid-20s and male. Uh, very few in the, the literature that would be under 18, for example, uh, but that might just be simply a case that the right questions have not been asked. But yeah, I, I, I've not read anything which would suggest that younger people are, are more susceptible. Okay, great, thank you. So next one is a comment, but it's only interesting, someone saying in the strips and popular European holiday destinations, often you have people walking up and down selling balloons, and so this is something that's come to Ibiza, Cavos, Malia, I didn't know that. And as for interest, Plinio, what about nitrous use in Brazil? Happened much? No, really, we have a lot of volatile substances, that's for mm -hmm. sure. And that's huge, huge, huge. And it's a really a, a thing for concern. But nitrous oxide, I haven't seen much. I, well, I've been out of there for seven years now. So I'm, uh, I think I need to go back. For <laughs> Sounds like it. And, and for another interesting point on the international bill, I wish I had something more to say on this, but as some of you may know, I uh, lived in Singapore for two years, mainly over the pandemic. And of course, that's somewhere where the traditional recreational drugs are not just a little bit illegal, but very, very, very illegal. And it's not just that, but you expect to get caught. Um, so kind of uh, ideal ground, one would think for, you know, it's got a very strong food and beverage industry. So there must be lots of nitrous oxide. Um, and I, I wish I knew how popular it was there. I'm sure it would be hidden it would be inside people's condo flats um, and wouldn't be, you know, click was, you know, as Harry was saying, it kind of looks like very pub. It looks very druggy when people are, have got the balloons to their mouths, which might explain some of the policy response. And I wish I had more to say um, on the Singaporean situation, which is it's kind of a unique country regarding drugs, I would say, but I wish I had more to say on that. Um, uh, another one. 
Yeah, so someone had asked about uh, using alcohol and drugs at the same time. And I say, so we'd heard actually about poly drug use, as in what, uh, what other drugs do they use? I'm sorry if this is something that's said that I missed, but are there any specific risks of saying nitrous with, you know, people use nitrous, nitrous to enhance their experience on ecstasy, on ketamine, on LSD, on, a, on alcohol and a night out? Are there any particular combinations of nitrous and using them at the same time to be worried about? Uh, I suppose it depends on your point of view. If you're a, if you're somebody's using nitrous to amplify the effects of other drugs, then they're probably not worried about it. <laughs> uh, you know, if you have a, a better high or a different type of high, I'm not aware of any toxicological or pharmacological interactions of note, maybe Vinio is, uh, but I think with the combination with alcohol, it's probably the behavioral risks there. So already nitrous oxide might uh, affect people's judgment, balance, you know, falling over accidents. And we know, of course, that alcohol is a CNS depressant as a risk factor for that. So there might be a behavioral combination there, but not aware of any pharmacological interactions. Anything on that? No, mainly the, also I would uh, stress that this, uh, this term that you used, um, mm -hmm. not pharmacological, but uh, behavioral mm -hmm. uh, type of uh, situations that then definitely happens, but yeah, pharmacological. I see. I see. One thing that's just come to mind in terms of the using nitrous with other drugs, I, some of you might be aware of the Erowid uh, website, and there's a fascinating account there of gases, people using LS, lots and lots of LSD with lots and lots of nitrous and some quite fascinating accounts of the psychonautic adventures that people have found. One person who wrote that blog found doing that. Um, one, I see another, I think this is probably a Plinio question to begin with. What's the difference between food grade and medical grade nitrous oxide? Um, usually medical grade is the highest, um percentage of gas that you can actually make it. So when you when you do something medical grade, you want to reach uh, uh, the pure uh, substance. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the food grade, sometimes you can have a bit of impurity in it. But when, when we're talking about this is, it could be like medical grade could be 99.5%, whereas the food grade could be 98.7%. So this is really marginal. But usually is important in the production uh, part because you have you need to have sometimes a more tightly controlled and, and tightly uh, um, ways of removing impurity when selling one or the other. And, and just to add on that, then of the course there's another source of nitrous oxide, uh, more rarely access, but that is it through industry. And I mentioned before the automobile industry, uh, and that is likely to be of much lower grade and to have harmful yeah. additives as well and impurities in as well. One thing I forgot to mention is the medical grade could also be uh, considered free of uh, microorganisms that you could possibly have a bit on the medical on the on the food grade as well. But this is on very 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 low amount. But when you depends on the specification that the medical grade has for these gas, uh, you have to be completely uh, absent from it. And it's basically a technical validation um, method uh, question usually. Awesome, thank you. So now we have the actual final question. We have four minutes to do it in. Um, and it's possible you may, I don't know if it, this is at either of your areas, but it's about school drugs education. And you know, we talked about all the harm reduction messages, how to get it to young people who might see most at risk here. So someone said, how do the speakers think we can better coordinate drug education through, through schools in the UK? What can we do to influence this further? Yeah, so this is definitely my area. And uh, if you are involved in delivery of school-based education, whether as a teacher or a provider, there's really good resources published by the PSHE Association. Uh, disclosure, I was in involved in editing that, but, but that is, it's in response to the new statutory sex and relationship and health education curriculum. And it's take, that guidance is taking a fresh approach to drug education. You know, it's perhaps not as progressive as may, many people might want, but it's definitely a step forward. 
and it's about honest conversations. It's about taking a whole school approach. So bringing in those expert links from the community and drug services. It's about ensuring that young people feel empowered to ask questions of teachers and, and other school staff. And it's about ensuring that uh, uh, school pupils uh, 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 don't feel stigmatized or not having stigmatized attitudes to fellow pupils. So my, my quick win for anyone developing educational resources is to check out those free guides and lesson plans, et cetera, on the PSHE website and going to the website of Resolve. Uh, and I think they'll probably even come into your school and you can commission them to deliver bespoke sessions. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we have two minutes. I don't know if either of you have a closing talk you want to add before we say goodbye. Uh, no, thanks very much, James. Just a final thing. I didn't make a note of this. I uh, didn't really talk about it. We, we spoke a lot about the neurological symptoms, uh, but there is a, 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 some uh, case studies which has looked at adverse psychiatric symptomatology as well. Again, in heavy users, uh, but uh, symptoms similar to psychosis, emotional problems, high levels of anxiety, that can also be that can also be experienced at not at the extreme levels, but at relatively lower levels as, as well. So maybe that's something uh, uh, those of you working with people who use drugs should be aware of as well, that it can cause psychiatric problems as well. Thank you very much. So I think we will close up. So thank you very much, everyone. So as I said, this is one of one of our highest attended. It's been great. And you know, most people can argue to have one hour off for, um, to watch something while they're at work, but we've still got 160 people after the full two hours. This is great. The fact, you know, we've filled every minute of this. This is also great. And yeah, fascinating. I've learned a huge amount from this. Um, so yeah, it's been absolutely wonderful. Great to meet you both, Harry and Cleneo. Um, look forward to meeting you again in the future. Um, and finally, 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 before I go, um, where is it? Just to share, we've got another one coming up. So I'll quickly share my own screen. So please join us in, um, in a few weeks time.